So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this lunchtime webinar hosted by the Royal College of Anaesthetists on behalf of the National Emergency Laparotomy Audit. I hope you've got your sandwiches. I hope you're sitting comfortably because we've got an hour of discussion ahead of us. Uh, we'll be talking about the impact of COVID-19 on emergency laparotomy patients, but not just that. We're going to go on to talk in a little bit more detail about what next for this high risk group of surgical patients. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome two speakers alongside me today for this lunchtime. We've got Ms. Lindsay Pierce, who is consultant surgeon in Salford and is the new surgical lead and research lead for the Nella project. And then I'm really pleased to welcome Professor Carol Peden, who's all the way over in Chicago right now, who is one of the founder members and one of the reasons that Nella is now in existence and that we're all here today. So going to move on to a little bit of housekeeping. So if you're going to submit any questions, just do that through the question and answers tab. If you have any problems with your audio and Zoom, exit and then come back in. We won't know that you've left or that you've come back, uh, but I hope you do come back. We'll be recording the webinar and it will be available to you in the future. And we'll also be emailing out a CPD certificate. And if you can, please complete the webinar survey when it's sent out. What we really want to know is what you might like to hear about in the future and future webinars that we'll have planned for the coming months. So let's move on to our first poll. So do you have fingers at the ready, a timed acute abdominal surgical pathway for your patients working from the moment when they first present to the hospital. I'll just give you about five seconds to start answering that. And then we'll be moving on to the first part of the talk. Yes or no? Okay. So, oops. Super. So we're just going to move on to the first part of the talk now. So the first death from COVID-19 in the UK was reported on March the 5th, almost just over a year ago now. And then on March the 16th, Boris announced that we should begin our social distancing, something we'd never really heard of. And then bang, March the 23rd, national lockdown happened and we all knew it was coming. The ambulance service reported that there was about 30% reduction in calls for chest pain in uh, the UK at that point. And the EDs are telling us that it was over half a reduction, a 50% reduction in the number of patients coming in to present to them for uh, acute um, MI or for heart failure. So clearly something happened to the population of this country when lockdown was announced in that they stopped coming to hospital. And that was exactly the same for the patients who are presenting for emergency bowel surgery. It's really obvious from this graph where March the 23rd is, something happened and we saw a 20% reduction in the number of patients presenting for their emergency laparotomy. So overall, during the time frame from March the 23rd to September, the 20, uh, September, we found that there was a reduction to 10,546 patients having emergency laparotomy. So 20% below what was the year before. And that is in keeping with what was described for other acute medical pathologies, such as heart failure, such as acute MIs, or vascular um, problems such as acute aneurysms. What we now really need to understand is to why that has happened. And the reasons for it could be multifactorial. For a start, we could have been operating on less patients. Perhaps the decision-making we made about who should have surgery changed during that time period. Perhaps we were operating on less high-risk patients. Perhaps we found that our data isn't as accurate as we think it is, and maybe there's a case ascertainment issue. We've got lots of questions that we now need to answer by analyzing the data in more detail and using the HES data and ONS data as it comes forward. At the moment, we can only speculate and wait to see if patterns of admission actually recover in the coming months or wait to see if pathologies that we usually uh, don't see, such as late presentations of issues, start to happen uh, in due course and with patients as they delay their presentation to us in uh, coming to hospital. But of this data set, oops, 867 patients had a perioperative diagnosis of COVID-19. Um, most of these patients were diagnosed post-operatively. So this really reflects in the beginning of the pandemic, how we didn't have access to rapid testing and that we weren't able to understand what was happening to these patients before they had their surgery. Interestingly, when we look at 
the patterns of operating, despite recommendations from places that are uh, organizations such as the Royal Colleges of Surgeons to avoid laparoscopic, uh, to avoid open surgery and to use laparoscopic surgery, we saw no change in the patterns of, of surgical procedures that happened during the pandemic. And importantly, we didn't really see any impact on, of the pandemic on the key standards of care that emergency laparotomy patients should receive. Patients still had their CT scan before their operation. There was a slight dip during March and April for patients who had COVID, probably reflecting our inability to get enough PPE or understand how we could get these patients to th uh, through the, the CT scanner safely. But on the whole, they had their CT scans before surgery. Patients still went to theatres in the correct time frame, and they still had their risk assessment performed regularly before the operation. But really impressively, given all the pressures that we had to face during the global pandemic, particularly as anaesthetists, we were still present for this high risk group of patients, both before and during their surgery. And I think this is a real indicator of how much the standards of care that we are wanting to provide our patients have hit home. And we still wanted to do that despite all the pressures that we were facing at that time. In fact, patients who needed to get their operations sometimes got there quicker than usual. And this probably reflects the lack of other emergency surgical procedures that were going on and access to the CPOD operating theatres. But what was really impacted detrimentally was admission to critical care after their operations. On the right hand side here is a chart from ICNARC and the orange column in April probably needs no explanation. This is the number of proportion of COVID patients in intensive care in April. And we can see it as it tails off over the coming months. On the left hand side is a figure from our recently published interim COVID report, which demonstrates clearly that patients were not able to access critical care. In March, uh, the patients who did not have COVID and had an emergency laparotomy were significantly less likely to have level two or level three care after their surgery, with only 58% of them accessing this. This is in comparison to the COVID patients, perhaps in recognition of the fact that they were higher risk, perhaps they were sicker, that they were much more likely to get to critical care. In April, it was slightly better and so on and so forth. And it started to improve back to almost pre-COVID levels. It will be interesting to see what happens to the data as we watch the second surge and any future changes and how we might then consider future proofing ourselves if we are to encounter any further uh, COVID surges in the coming months to make sure that these patients still access a high level of care after this high risk surgery. So did this impact on our outcomes? Well, Length of stay was clearly affected and in quite an interesting way. Patients who had COVID, fairly obviously it might seem, had a significantly longer length of stay in hospital um, and uh, with almost double the time spent there. But patients who did not have COVID had a much shorter length of stay than usual, probably reflecting that we wanted to get them out of hospital as quickly as possible and away from any risk of contracting COVID whilst they are in, in staying with us in hospital. But really quite importantly, mortality after surgery uh, it was what we're all interested in. So if you look in our report, it'll be, you can find it in table 14, but overall the mortality for patients who had COVID was significantly higher than for those who did not have COVID. This is self-explanatory. But what's really important when we look at it in a little bit more detail, that is for patients, the older you get, the higher the risk. But if you, or if you are aged over 65, you have an almost 20% chance of de dying within 30 days after your surgery if you have COVID. Uh, this is compared to only 12.5% if um, in the previous year when COVID wasn't around. So mortality is significantly higher if you have COVID-19 and have an emergency laparotomy, which surely must influence our decision-making uh, going forward about who may be appropriate. Interestingly, and we will have future webinars on the topic of when is surgery futile, shared decision making, when is it appropriate to operate on these high-risk surgical patients. But interestingly, we did have patients over the age of 90 who had COVID and did have an emergency laparotomy. Uh, their outcomes, there's not very many of them in the database, but their outcomes are relatively poor. So what are the key messages? So the number of patients presenting or to have emergency laparotomy significantly reduced during the global pandemic. We don't yet fully understand where they all went. And actually we still haven't recovered to the normal number of patients that we would be seeing in the similar time frame having surgery. 
But we are now the world's biggest database about patients having COVID-19 and laparotomy. And that's down to you who kept entering data for us during such pressured times. And thank you for that. It means we can represent what happens to them and we can learn for the future. But we've managed to maintain the standards of care that we've been talking about for the last four or five years, despite the unprecedented pressures that we were facing. However, mortality was significantly higher, and this must influence our future decision making and how we may future proof ourselves, uh, making sure the patients get the care they need. And we will need to understand the long term implications of COVID-19 on recovery after major surgery. So it's probably time for us now to move forward in how we consider care for patients having emergency surgery. We've really probably done the easy bits. We've improved consultant present. We've got used to recognizing risk and talking about it. We've reorganized our structures as much as possible that patients can access level two or level three care. So now we probably need to do the difficult stuff. Can we improve other parts of the care pathway, engaging the multidisciplinary team, improving nutrition, rehabilitation, and maybe there's even a place for enhanced recovery after emergency surgery. So on that note, I will hand over to the results for poll one and hand over to Lindsay. Thanks, Sarah, that was great, brilliant. Right, let's have a look at what these results for poll one show. So do you have a timed acute abdominal pathway commencing when the patient first presents to the hospital that includes a multidisciplinary team? It's nearly a 50-50 split, not quite. Uh, the majority just slightly um, not really uh, able to provide that acute time pathway at the moment. Be really interested to know why those reasons are and what problems and barriers people have had um, trying to implement a time pathway. All right. OK, so it must be time for another poll. So back to Sarah um, to introduce poll question number two. You'd think I'd learn after a year of COVID to not be on mute during a webinar. Um, so poll number two at our hospital, we run post discharge follow up clinics for emergency laparotomy patients. I'll give you a few seconds to answer that one. Thank you, everyone. So I will now hand over to Lindsay. And Lindsay is our new Sonia Lockwood. Uh, and she is at Salford Royal and is the new surgical lead for the emergency laparotomy audit. And I'll hand over now. Thanks, Sarah. Right, let's switch screens. And um, I'll be able to share my presentation with you. So the new Sonia Lockwood, that sounds like a title I've not heard before. Um, so hopefully I can live up to uh, Sonia's, um, Sonia's work. So what I want to do is just quickly kind of run through a little bit about um, how we engage a wider workforce and a wider MDT. As Sarah's talked about, we've kind of nailed that low hanging fruit. So where do we go from here and how can we um, improve things a little bit further? Oops, done exactly what Sarah did and skipped too far. There we go. So in order to see where we're going to go in five years, we need to look at where we've been five years ago and things have moved on a lot. The way that the data is now presented, the way that the reports look is very different and we have made improvement in outcomes. But what I'd really like to see now as surgical lead moving forward is trying to look towards a bit of summative learning and a bit of shared learning. So we provide individual hospital reports. Um, to organisations. Uh, we re rely on hospitals to track their own outcomes. What we've not really looked at is that summative um, report, looking at which areas of, of uh, organisations improved, which areas perhaps um, need a little bit more improvement. So I'd be asking organisations to look regionally, look around your different hospitals, see if there are elements or audit standards where your um, your neighbouring uh, hospitals are, are particularly maybe doing well or have improved significantly and what could you learn? What we do know and we do accept is that there is absolutely not a one size fits all um, approach to any of this. You cannot just pick up a service out of a neighbouring organisation and drop it into yours. The infrastructure just isn't there to support it and it won't work. But there may be elements of different people's um, approaches that you can take on board yourself. I want to try and look as surgical lead more at the entirety of um, the emergency laparotomy pathway. So I think there's a little bit of confusion about NELA sometimes in the wider um, clinical group. So 
is NILA an audit? Is it a pathway that we're trying to develop? Is it describing a patient journey? Um, I think for me, NILA obviously is an audit, but it's an audit which describes and measures a patient's journey right from a pre-hospital um, uh, start point right to discharge and beyond into the community. And whilst I, I agree with Sarah, we've got that low hanging fruit, the consultant presence during that in, in hospital episode. I think there's still quite a significant amount of work that can be done, particularly on the front end of the pathway, but also a little bit on the, um, on the later aspects too. So let's just consider, for example, the emergency department. So we have a four hour uh, emergency standard of care um, and patients arrive into the hospital. What as Neela lead or as um, a clinician involved in Neela in your organisation, um, what sort of relationships do you have with your emergency department colleagues? Do your emergency department clinicians understand what Neela is? Do they understand why we're using the audit metrics that we're using? Do they understand the implications for patients in terms of outcome of not delivering these things? What about your advanced care practitioners in the emergency department? Do they understand? Do the nursing team understand? What sort of relationship do you have with your radiology colleagues, with your radiographers who are going to be calling those patients through to CT, um, hopefully in a timely manner, to try and get them those diagnostic scans quickly? Patients who come into the emergency department are not all coming at this from the same standpoint. So patients will come in uh, with an acute abdomen. They may have been unwell for three weeks at home. They may have been unwell for three hours at home. It's difficult in COVID now because we don't have lots of relatives, carers and, and a sort of support network present within the department. So it might be that you actually need to phone home. You need to phone home and you need to find out what's been going on for this patient. When was the last time that they were well? When was the last time that they were eating and drinking normally? Their nutrition will have a significant impact upon their outcome during the uh, pathway. It might be that you need to ring the GP to find out some of these things if you haven't got access to uh, primary care electronic um, health records, which lots of people don't. What's really well documented is that we know that a delay in getting to theatre or getting to source control has a significant detrimental effect on outcome for these patients. So the top paper here was published by um, our, on NILA data, 6% increased risk of death per hour for a perforated peptic ulcer. Take a step back and look at everything else that we do within, um, within medicine. We give chemotherapy agents that confer less benefit. We give cardiac medications that confer less benefit. So really, if this is about time, if we try and look at aggregation of marginal gains, particularly on that front end of the pathway, it may be that those small aggregation of marginal gains can get, lead to a significant improvement in outcome uh, for, for these patients. So I would ask you at this point, now looking forward to the next five years for um, NILA, uh, engage with all your um, allied healthcare professional colleagues, your clinical colleagues in different areas. We are really, really, really lucky that COVID has allowed us to move into quite a new technological area. We've, um, we, we're not limited by technology anymore. So jump onto Microsoft Teams, jump onto Zoom, email people, connect with people, connect with other healthcare clinicians. We've got Sarah in Whitstable and Carol in Chicago. So I think if we can pull people together for a webinar like this, we can certainly pull together an MDT um, within an organization for our patients. So that's a whistle stop, but that's all I want to say at this point. Um, but thank you for the opportunity to deliver this to you as part of my first NILA webinar. And um, thank you to um, uh, Sarah for committing to delivering lots of um, these webinars uh, together over the next coming years. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, you will be really pleased to know that I was the new Dave Murray for quite a long time. So being the new Sonia Lockwood, you know, it could be worse. Um, so I think it's time to see the results from poll two. No. So 77% uh, 
say no, there's no post-discharge follow-up clinics for emergency laparotomy patients. So we can close down that poll there. Um, I think this is really important and something in the Q&A boxes would be great to see from teams and colleagues around the country to put in the Q&A about why. Why is it that you are not able to run follow-up clinics? We offer uh, post-operative clinics and follow-up to the majority of elective surgical patients whose risk of morbidity and mortality is significantly lower and they get support throughout their whole care pathway. So what is it about the fact that we have emergency surgical patients who are high risk with massive impact on their life that we can't offer this to them? So if we could get some comments from people that would be super. Lindsay, why do you, any thoughts about this as to why we might not be able to run these uh, these um, clinics so easily? Do you think it's something to do with the multidisciplinary nature? Who should run them? Should it be ITU? Should it be surgeons? I think it's difficult, isn't it? It's such a heterogeneous po population to try and um, pull into a clinic. Um, and, and everybody is different. Their needs are different at discharge, aren't they? And I think we've tried as um, you know surgeons to move away from routine follow-up clinics. Um, and maybe the emergency laparotomy patients have been pulled in as being considered as, as routine patients. I think they're anything but routine. I think they're extremely challenging um, with complex needs throughout the pathway and at discharge. And so I think I think they, they should be seen in the outpatient clinic, um, preferably with a multidisciplinary team approach. But I think we're away from that at the moment. And Carol, what, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think emergency surgical patients are sometimes the, the Cinderella group of our, of our patients? What are your thoughts about this? Well, I think that's why, you know, we started all this a long time ago at the beginning, because it was so apparent that, um, you know, you had your elective colonic resection and you had a whole different team compared to and a whole different process to what uh, you would experience if you came in in the middle of the night when your risk was much higher. And, you know, when way back years ago, when I started all this looking at the data, it was just so striking, the risk for these patients. And yet there was no research and nobody was talking about it. So I, I do think we've, we've completely changed that conversation now with Neela, which is fantastic. So let's bring up poll three now from audience participation whilst you're having your lunch. Talking about the multidisciplinary team, at our hospital, we have a Nella emergency laparotomy nurse specialist. Yes or no? Well, I didn't realise I could vote in this as well. That's great. Um, we'll come to the answers of that in, the, in a little bit, but now I am going to hand over to Carol, um, who's going to talk to us about enhanced recovery after surgery. Can we even do this for emergency surgical patients? And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing if we can or not. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's good morning in Chicago. Let me get the slides up. So yes, I liked Sarah's title about can you really ERAS MLAP? Well, I, th I think you can, and I'm going to briefly run through why I think you can. Um, oops. Uh -huh. okay. So just um, a little bit of background to me, um, for those of you who may not know me, um, I was one of the co-founders of NILA. Um, and I led the EPOC and the ELC studies that were based on NILA data. And now that I'm in the US, I'm uh, working as a consultant to the American College of Surgeons on their emergency surgery program. And also, also which will become relevant in this chair of the American Society of Anesthesiologists Brain Health Initiative. Um, brief background, you all know this, but I thought I'd show you some of the US data as opposed to the UK data. Um, huge increase in, um, emergency general surgery admissions between 2001 and 2010. And as we all know that the emergency surgical cases are a small, relatively small number of all surgical cases, but huge part of the death. So this is where we need to concentrate if we want to improve surgical outcomes. And just some of the key papers there, um, Angela Ingraham's work at the bottom here, looking at the adherence to emergency general surgery standards. And of course, you know, big variation and when you see variation you know there's room for improvement. Uh, way back when we got the first emergency laboratory network data at the same time it was data from the US NSCIP database on 37,000 patients showing a 14% mortality at 30 days. 
And that coincided with really what we saw with the network data um, prior to NILA, where the 30-day mortality was nearly 15%, but 25% nearly if you were over 80. And again, this big variation showing room for improvement. Uh, this is data from Zara Cooper's work in the US in patients over 65. And remember the deaths, we usually look at 30 day mortality, but these deaths for these patients keep on happening. So look at the data at 180 days. If you are over 85, 50% mortality. And it's the complications that lead to that cascade of events um, that bring about death. And there's more and more data coming out at the moment, particularly in the US about failure to rescue in emergency laparotomy patients and how one complication builds with another to this uh, cascade of uh, decline, if you like. And so I think if we're thinking about enhanced recovery, it's that very focused pathway of care to get on top of these complications quickly and reduce the risk for these patients. They really, many of them, particularly the elderly, only get one shot. So just a reminder, and I, I really like showing this slide, we, we've achieved amazing things with Neela. And every time, you know, when life has been hard over the last year or so, we should really reflect on what we've done for these surgical patients. Um, we started with mortality around 15% and it's now 9%. So congratulations to all of you for all that work. So moving on to enhanced recovery, can we do it for uh, this emergency surgical group? Well, obviously, We've just written the first guideline, so I think we can. And if you look at this, this is from uh, the original NHS Institute work, getting the patient in the best possible condition for surgery. Now, Lindsay um, talked about the first few hours and we've, we've taken from perhaps a month preparing a patient for elective surgery to a few hours. But those first few hours are really key. And if you look here, it's risk assessment, patient information, informed decision make, making, uh, managing patients' expectations, optimizing their condition, which are all in the elective pathway, but we can do it, uh, admittedly, in a very short period of time, and we can't perhaps do it all, but we can start to think about it for uh, the ERAS um, MLAP. So in the past couple of years, there's been a lot more data coming out. A lot of these are small studies um, or systematic reviews, but I just put them there and they're in our ERAS guidelines, which I'll show you in a minute, but more and more evidence coming out that an ERAS approach works for these patients to reduce morbidity, uh, mortality and length of stay. So you can, I'll show you the, the ERAS paper and all these references are in there. And again, Lindsay referred to it. I think that these pathways are complex but there's a reason why the ERAS guidelines that we've just published, we focused on pre-op. Intra and post-op are coming shortly, but there's so much work that needs to be done in the first few hours when the patient presented. And there's so much literature now that we focused just on uh, pre-op. Uh, a little background to how the thinking between, behind certainly my approach and perhaps the UK approach to using an ERAS type um, pathway for emergency laparotomy was uh, the ELPQUIC study, which we did between uh, Royal Surrey, Royal Devon and Exeter, Bath and South Devon, using these five key components of the pathway, primarily again, focusing on this urgency preoperatively, early assessment and resuscitation, early assessment for sepsis, prompt diagnosis and early surgery, goal-directed fluid therapy, and this concept of ICU for all, and this multidisciplinary team approach. So this was very much an enhanced recovery approach to emergency laparotomy. And that paper was published in 2015 in the British Journal of Surgery, and it showed um, a crude reduction in mortality and a risk, a significant reduction in risk-adjusted mortality with this approach and particularly associated, significant association between improvement in mortality uh, with ICU admission and goal-directed fluid therapy. And the improvement in mortality was higher, was, so there was better outcomes for those higher risk patients, so the older patients with this type of enhanced recovery approach. We published this paper from Bath, which extended the ELPQUIC study. And we found that actually, as we kept on with that study, our mortality got even better. And um, in the six months after we ended the ELPQUIC study, 
our mortality reduced, this is this top line, this is survival benefit um, to 5% in bars. So showing that it's really possible to make a big improvement. And interestingly as well, remember ERAS often shows that it saves money, that we found even though we were spending up front more money on each patient, um, by the end of it, because the survival and the uh, complications were decreased, the cost of each patient and more survival, better outcomes was reduced. That then evolved into the Emergency Laparotomy Collaborative, which we scaled up Elpquick across the south of England. Um, again, with this ERAS type approach of clear goals, clear timelines, defined metrics, using the NELA data and a standardized pathway. In addition to Elpquick though, in ELC, we in Emergency Laparotomy Collaborative, we had an increased focus on sepsis and the care of the elderly. Uh, promoted the enhanced recovery approach, um, coaching on change management. As you all know, it's hard to make change happen. Um, virtual site visits and a, very much a focus on getting that group dynamic to work together. And again, we saw a reduction in the mortality rate, um, in, outperformed the NELA data, reduction in length of stay and improvements in process measures. And that was published um, in JAMA Surgery a couple of years ago. All this work has been built on um, Delphi consensus because when we started this, there were no evidence-based guidelines. So Ian Anderson, Nick Leese, myself, multiple other people got together and really came up with ideas of what, um, what a good pathway should look like. And Nick Lees read this, uh, led this from Salford, led this uh, update of the high risk general surgical patient in 2018, which I'd really recommend you looking at. And again, we drew on this work for the ERAS uh, pathway and of course, all the work done in NILA. So these are the new uh, guidelines from the uh, International ERAS Society. They were published, well, they've just uh, out in the journal, published online um, about a month ago. It's an international group, lots of representatives from NILA, including Sarah. Um, Carolyn Johnson will be joining us for part two and Dave Murray, will. We'll, we're going to write an implement, implementation approach as well. Um, we have UK surgeons, but we also have a very international group. Um, so we have representation from the USA, from Europe, Australasia and South America. Uh, we have general surgeons and emergency surgeons because a lot of the emergency surgery is done in the US by emergency surgeons, anesthesiologists, and importantly, geriatricians. We undertook a review of the literature from 2005 to July 2020. And I can definitely say that having been involved with uh, emergency laparotomy for a long time, there's now so much more in the literature than there was right at the beginning. Uh, we use the GRADE approach and a Delphi consensus to make our recommendations. And this is the whole pathway. As I say, what I've just shown you is only part one, which is preoperative. And it became apparent there was so much that we needed to focus on in preoperative, uh, the ERAS emergency laparotomy pathway that it was a paper in its own right. And you can see the counseling, education, preoperative risk scoring up front, end of life discussion may be appropriate, patient op optimization, um, sepsis, a real focus on sepsis. If you look at the literature now, which we've written up in this paper, there is so much about the risk of sepsis for these patients. Um, risk stratification, and then general ERAS principles. So these are the recommendations. Number one, early identification of physiological derangement and intervention. So a real focus using um, an early warning score or a track, some kind of physiological track and trigger protocol. Screening and monitoring for sepsis. And again, if you look at the literature, it's so impressive, the risk of patients if they're septic. Uh, with the, the um, UK National Surgical Collaborative, we uh, looked at patients across the UK and 20% of emergency ge general surgical patients are septic or in septic shock. So really we should be doing this as a default. Early imaging, surgery and source control of sepsis, risk assessment. And then these are the first ERAS guidelines to have age-related evaluation of frailty, 
um, delirium and cognitive assessment in them. And I'll speak a little bit more about that in a second. The other things are relatively uh, standard, as you would expect, reversal of antithrombotic med medications, assessment of VTE risk, um, pain management preoperatively, preoperative glucose and electrolyte management. We did not recommend preoperative carbohydrate loading in the emergency patients. There's no evidence for it. Preoperative nasogastric uh, intubation on a patient and surgeon assessment. And then quite a lot, which Sarah had a lot of input into on patient and family education and shared decision-making. So with this focus on the elderly, um, a real, as I say, the first DRS guidelines to have these because we acknowledge in emergency surgery, the impact of age and frailty. And also a new focus on delirium and screening and avoidance of Beers criteria drugs. So in Beers criteria drugs, are those that are a high risk in the elderly and from a UK anesthesia perspective, primarily it's going to be benzodiazepines. Um, some very good papers coming out. Now I'd recommend uh, Rachel Kadaru's work on uh, published in JAMA surgery about this, again, a kind of proactive approach to the older patient showing a, a very significant risk re uh, reduction in mortality and morbidity. And then of course, data from NILA, and then this American Geriatric Society recommendation on delirium. Other things in the preoperative optimization, this rapid assessment, some urgency of resuscitation, the screening for sepsis. And if you have, if you're over 60, you have a comorbidity and you're having emergency surgery, you have a huge risk if all those factors come together and you're septic. Shared decision-making and then this minimization of time to surgery. And we recommend this using um, the surviving sepsis campaign bundle of care. And then I'd, this paper came out after we published the ERAS guidelines, but it's it published in JAMA Surgery just recently. And they are saying that post-operative delirium is the single most uh, significant complication that the surgical community needs to look at. And we put thinking about delirium in the pre-op assessment for these emergency patients because they're septic, they're sick, they may be in pain. So they are at risk, I acknowledge, and. I want to be very pragmatic in the approach that this may not all be possible to do frailty assessment, to do cognitive assessment, but I want people to start thinking about it up front. So even if it can't happen preoperatively, it happens quickly in the post-operative period. Um, earlier this year, we published in the BJA six key things from an evidence uh, consensus base about um, delirium prevention. Education was number one. And the only group we uh, recommended to preoperative assessment for delirium in was uh, the emergency surgical patients because they're so high risk. So have a look at that. It's, again, this paper is designed to be very practical um, and focused on things that you can actually do without new drugs or techniques or resources. So other ERAS management in our pre-op guidelines, correction of fluid and electrolyte abnormalities, which can be significant, correction of anticoagulants and antiplatelet drugs, because of course, many of these patients will be on them. Um, emergency surgery patients have a high risk of VTE. I think in the UK, we're, we're pretty much on that. That may be less consistent in the US. The need for analgesia. And remember, um, while opioids can cause delirium in the older patients, so can pain. So it's really about that optimal management of pain. NG tube on a patient by patient basis and no evidence for carbohydrate loading. So we do not recommend that. So that is a whistle top stops tour through our pre-op guidelines. Uh, Intra-op and post-operative guidelines are coming in the next few months um, with again, with representatives from NILA and UK surgical groups on that. Um, in the Post-op guidelines will be discussing use of ICU. And I was just discussing, I've been writing that. And there's a lot about the risk for emergency patients, emergency general surgical patients of reintubation and pulmonary complications. So I think we need, that's one thing. Lindsay was challenging us. We've got the low front hanging fruit, what comes next? I think um, thinking about what do we do about pulmonary complications? There's evidence coming out that it's the pulmonary complications in these patients postoperatively that uh, lead to this cascade of events of increasing numbers of other complications and, and failure to rescue. 
So that's an area to think about. Um, quality improvement in audit is already happening very much in the UK with NILA. Other countries have, have time to catch up. And again, as, as the other two speakers alluded to, um, it's all very well making all these recommendations. The challenging part is putting them all together into the system organization and the system of care. Um, and then end of life care. Uh, we, we chose to put that in the post-operative piece, um, but of course the assessment of patients and their risk comes prior to surgery. And that needs to be done very much on an individual basis. And then um, just I put together this, this slide, which comes from uh, the Epoch pathway and Tim Stevens and I writing about, yes, we need evidence-based interventions. And it's so great that there's now so much more evidence. We need the measurement and data feedback, which Neela is giving us, but we need the motivation and focus, the community of practice, which Neela builds, quality improvement skills and multidisciplinary team training. So there's a lot to do. Um, and I'm very happy to take questions. I hope you think that's helpful. I hope you think that we can. IRAS MLAP, MLAP, it was all built on concepts developed through NILA and I'd be happy to take any questions afterwards. Thank you. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Carol. That's lots and lots of lots for us to think about there. Um, looking forward to those interoperative and postoperative guidelines. And it looks like end of life is almost like the bookends, isn't it? We need input at the beginning and at the end as well. Um, yeah. So, so just to pick up on that, um, one thing that we talk about quite frequently is those high risk patients that um, we assess as being high risk subjectively and objectively, but yet that patient or their family still really, really want us to proceed with an emergency laparotomy. What, what do we do in those situations? When is, when is high risk too high risk? Well, I think as you know, it's, it's so individual and um, that's a difficult question to answer. I think we have to be, we have to guide the patient family and our decision-making based on data. But as you know, again, each the risk assessments are done on a population basis and every individual is individual. And there are the case, and as you as a surgeon, we're very aware of a patient with a perforated peptic ulcer whose risk score comes out as very, very high, but in fact, rapid surgery will save their life. Um, I think perhaps a, a more challenging question is that once we commit to the surgery, we have to commit to giving the patient the best possible care right the way through. We have to go through with it and they get one shot, as I said. And again, with that MLAP approach of urgency, do it right first time, and then perhaps agree with the patient and family, maybe there'll be a period of reassessment. Yeah. yeah. Some point. But I think once we commit, we have to do everything, uh, yeah. ICU, everything as best as we can to give that patient the best shot. Yeah, so get the decision right at the beginning and, um, and, and operate in a timely fashion. Okay, right. So can we have a look at the poll three results now, Nina? So the question was around, do you have an emergency laparotomy uh, nurse specialist within the hospital? Less than a quarter of all sites say that yes, they have. Okay, so so again, it's about those, um, you know, it, it broadening the workforce, uh, enhancing our workforce and allied healthcare professionals and how they all contribute to, to the pathway. Um, I know we've got one emergency laparotomy nurse on because I've seen a comment from Maggie um, in Paisley where she said, uh, all their LSAT patients are followed up at the outpatient clinic alongside colorectal and stoma clinics. That's interesting. So running a, running a clinic alongside other specialist clinics, um, which, um, presumably benefit, benefit patients. What do you think though, um, Carol and Sarah, um, about um, involvement of other um, allied healthcare professionals in those clinics like dieticians and occupational therapists? And what about psychology in, the, in emergency laparotomy? Um, come to Sarah first. Yeah, so I think I'm really pleased we brought this up because one of the questions that's in the Q&As at the moment is um, the emergency laparotomy patient doesn't need a special clinic. Uh, they can just go to any clinic alongside the elective surgical patients. Um, and I think that's an interesting concept because patients are not prepared for their emergency laparotomy. And we know from um, some previous work done and some patient focus groups that they really suffer from significant um, almost post-traumatic stress 
type disorders after their surgery. So they have a huge change in lifestyle. And after that, there are psychological impacts of that. And I know that Julie Cornish uh, in Cardiff is running, uh, starting at the Polo study, which will be looking at the psychological impact and whether or not we can put in place any support after that that's particular and specific for emergency surgical patients. I think the other difficult thing in emergency surgical patients is that we don't necessarily know how or when to collect patient reported outcome measures. So there has been some early work done, um, uh, which uh, Dave Murray was involved in, but the difficulty is what do we ask and when do we ask and how do we measure? And because there's such a heterogeneous group of patients, the impact on patients in their 30s, we have some young mums who come to our survivors club at Medway, for example, is very different to the impact for an 85 year old gentleman. And somehow we've got to structure what we do for our patients post-operatively to look after all of those different needs. So, so I, think, I think there is a, a significant impact on psychology and it's something we probably need to understand a little bit better. I'm not sure what you think, Carol, about this as well. I think. You're right, Sarah, and I think the work you've done with your patient follow-up, you know, clinics is is fantastic and and very striking. Some of the stories you've told, I think one of the thing one of the things I've been doing with American College of Surgeons with Angela Ingraham, one of the surgeons involved, is we wrote quite a big piece of preoperative inf information for patients. It's like you know, it's a it's a big pamphlet, and you helped us a little bit with that, Sarah. Um, and it's the idea is you can give it to the patient or you can give it to the family probably preoperatively because then they have something to prepare them for the steps you know when they, when the patient goes to ICU or the patient can reflect on that and they have really good evidence-based you know literature to look through when they they come they come back from surgery and they've got time and I think there's we're talking about what else can we do um, working with some of the U.S. surgical collaboratives they're starting to um, videotape some things and, and give those to patients or videotapes and physio exercises and mobilization. So I think, again, we can think differently about how we give patients and how we work with patients um, post-op. I think what's really important there is that we're alluding to the concept of shared decision making uh, for this high risk surgery and I'm, I can see that someone has put uh, anonymously actually in which is interesting in the questions and answers that it always feels like no one wants to be the clinician that says this is futile the surgeons will always operate and it feels like it's more defensive practice sometimes and I think this is interesting about the definition of futility because we're doing some work at the moment with one of our um, Nella surgical fellows uh, who is looking at when is surgery numerically futile? Can we work that out? But actually, how do we know that that futility for us is death? Death is very easy to measure. It's a very, very binary thing. You're dead or you're alive after your surgery. But is there more to it as we do shared decision making? The psychology of the family, perhaps, afterwards, how are we making our decisions about when and what is futile? And I know that CPOC uh, are doing some work about shared decision making, particularly in elective patients, and we'll be bringing this in to the work stream for emergency surgical patients, because the concept of using brand, the brand model, so what's the benefits, what's the risks, what are the alternatives and what happens if we do nothing are still just as applicable for emergency laparotomy patients as they are for the elective surgical patient, which might help us in some of this decision making. Um, a fate worse than death changes, we know from um, a small piece of work in America, actually, the closer you are to death. So right now we might think that a stoma is the absolute end of the world and you'd rather go out in a box than have a stoma. But actually, when you were close to it, you might change your mind. Lindsay, you probably have some experience of this in your clinics when you when you see these emergency surgical patients. Yeah, I think um, and, and I think you raise a really good point there about, you know, sort of explaining all options to the patients in a very realistic way, because we're very good. I think, it, well, I'm probably generalizing, but I think we're getting much better at doing that in an elective practice, you know, really spelling it out for patients, giving them time to ruminate and think about, about what they want to, how they want to proceed. But I think in an emergency situation, it often becomes really quite emotive and shared decision-making is, is a term that is now branded around quite readily, but what does shared decision-making actually mean to a group of consultant surgeons? What does shared decision-making mean to a group of anaesthetists and, um, and emergency medicine primary care. I think everybody comes at it from a slightly different place and then trying to put all those people together and then come up with a decision is, is really quite 
challenging and I think the way that we work in sort of UK rotors where we where we kind of days and nights and handing over and things sometimes we're enacting decision making that has gone on by other people um in in the daytime maybe when we're coming in at night time and I think that then can put you in a really difficult position um so um the surgeons will always operate I would absolutely stand up and say the surgeons will not always operate <laughs> Um, so I think one of the questions that's come up in our Q&As uh, is about the role of the ELC, the Emergency Laparotomy Collaborative, and does it still have a role uh, going forwards? Now, I know Carol uh, might like to talk about this as one of the founders and one of the deliverers of ELC when it first started up. Is there still a place? Is there still a time for quality improvement at this? Or as one of the other questions says, doesn't it just need to be consultant delivered care 24-7 to make a difference? Well, I think um, consultants can, you know, deliver care. It doesn't necessarily need to be the right thing. I think we're all, I think, then somebody else says, on comparisons with the US, if it's furious, organization is so different. I think actually the UK and things like NILA, there's a lot of advantages because we can have common data entry with NILA. We can have these kind of conversations. The US is so disparate with small hospital systems, different states. So I think the UK, I mean, and please don't underestimate the fantastic work that goes on in the UK. I mean, really, Neela is, is world class and the things that have been achieved. Um, I think, yeah, quality improvement. I think we can have consultants, but they've got to be doing the right things. They've got to be focusing. And as Lindsay said, you know, we've got to work as a team because as, as the consultant surgeon, you can't be in the emergency department. So we need everybody working together. So we need improvement. We need standards of care, we need pathways. So what do you think we can learn from the, so the ethnographic part of the EPOC study that we can translate as we take these ERAS guidelines forward as we talk more about pathways? Yeah, if we're talking about EPOC, there was a lot of learning. I think, um, you know, trying to do, and we all accept this, trying to do improvement when there's so many other things going on is difficult. I think that one of the things that came out in with the ethnography, which for those of you who are not familiar with ethnography is kind of the study of why people do things and why things work, was that people really liked standardized pathways and risk assessment, helping them guide discussions and decision making. Because if you're a breast surgeon who ends up with having to do emergency and it's not your common area, then having some clear guidelines and having some risk assessment where you can talk to ICU was very helpful. So that was one of the things that came out of that. So Lindsay, there's um, there's a question that's come up that do you think this approach that we're discussing could damage the altruism of the surgeons and shift you towards a more percentage directed approach? How do we avoid that? And how do we afford, uh, avoid data fiddling essentially uh, to for the quality assurance side? Yeah, I mean, it's an, in, it's an interesting point, an interesting question, I think. I mean, I'm probably coming at it from a slightly different perspective, perhaps, than every surgeon uh, across the country, because obviously I'm, I'm invested in, in the, well, that's one thing that we've not, um, we've not nailed down, have we? Is it Nila or is it Nella? I'm still not quite sure, because Carol says Nila and you say Nella, so that's on my list of things that we need to... <laughs> But you know, I'm coming at it from a from a person that's really invested in the process. And um, uh, is it going to push us towards a percentage directed approach? Um, I, I I don't think so. I don't think so. I think I think surgeons uh, in general have really got their eyes open to this entire process. And I think um, the term shared decision making has been branded around. And I think that's something that surgeons actually are really like grateful of and and actually embrace as a as a as a group of clinicians because I think up to the last few years we probably have really felt like the responsibility sits on the person's name who is above that bed but I think we're now moving away from that and, and it is more of a team approach. Carol what do you think about this are we percentage driven now how do we avoid it are we tick box exercising? I, I don't think so um you know, when we, we published a paper just recently in anesthesia about sustainability, where we were very honest about the work at Bath, that, you know, we, we did the UpQuick project, we got better, we got even better, and then things changed and we got worse again. And we went back and, and one of the, you know, things we had to look at was, was our subsequent further improvement because we were operating on less patients and there was no evidence of that. Um, but I think we were more conscious of how we manage the very high risk patients. So um, I, don't, I don't think that's the case. I think 
people, you know, I, I think we, if good clinicians will write down why they're doing something and talk to the patient and family. So I don't think that's the case. I just wanted to quickly address the post-op delirium has been a problem for years question that's in the, in the questions. Are we just accepting it happens? Perhaps it's too hard. I think it is hard, but I think there's more and more evidence coming out that again, we can do something with it. And I'd um, suggest, you know, you look at Sharon Inouye's work on the hospital elder life program, which is again, simple things about giving patients, we all know this, but just making sure it happens, giving them their hearing aids, glasses back as soon as possible, um, you know, orienting them, not using benzodiazepines, it does show that you can reduce delirium. So it's possible to impact that. And this, this patient group is very high risk. Yeah, and I think um, we have to have this, as we, as we build upon the standards that Ned has been reporting on for so long, we have to have a more holistic uh, way of looking after our patients. There is more to it than just uh, a big drip and a tube and some goal-directed fluid therapy, which is mentioned here in the questions as well, uh, which where they're asking, um, what is the evidence for goal-directed fluid therapy? This is the main barrier I have convincing my colleagues to adopt it. Well, um, for our questioner, there is the Floella trial that's going on. So Nella supports a lot of research uh, and there's an awful lot of data to be taken from it, both retrospectively and prospectively. So if you can sign up for the Floella trial and look that up, there's a big plug for Mark Edwards and his work, um, then that will help us answer the question whether goal-directed fluid therapy works in this hugely heterogeneous group of patients. So we're coming towards the end of our, our lunchtime webinar. Um, we've just got a couple of minutes left uh, just to remind you that a recording will come to your inboxes uh, a little bit later on and please fill out your feedback. We're going to be back with some more webinars over the coming months. Uh, we will be covering topics such as futility, uh, such as shared decision making. Um, and we will be inviting a whole host of speakers to join us. And we'd really like to hear from you. If you at your hospital are doing some work that is interesting, or you want to hook up with people who are doing something similar, then please let us know, because the only way we're gonna improve care for these patients is if we work together to do so. And it just remains for me to say a huge thank you uh, to Lindsay and to Carol for joining me this lunchtime. Uh, and we will see you all again very soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. <laughs>